Hello everyone, welcome to Help Me Buy Property Podcast. This is episode number two. This episode, we are going to talk about serviceability traps and how to avoid banks saying no to you and how to unstuck your portfolio. But before we get into the deep end, let me introduce Moby, my co-host, and let's hear him talk a bit about his story. And uh, yeah, over to you, Moby. What do you? Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Moss, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this um, great podcast. I guess uh, my journey has been uh, pretty interesting. I have been a uh, peer AYG employee for last seventeen years. Um, I've been in corporate sales. Started from selling credit cards to consumers to selling personal loans to um, telecommunications enterprise sales. Um, since last two years, um, since COVID happened, it gave us an opportunity to think about what are we doing with our life. So since then, um, I've set up a mobile dental company which provides dental care to children at their school or kindergartens. So we're just bridging that gap. So so I guess um, the transitioning from awesome. Uh, being an employee to um, a um, small business owner has been very rewarding. Um, we broke the shackles of nine to five and um, by far that's the best thing ever happened. And I think it also has helped with my property portfolio journey as well. And obviously you've been mentoring me along the way. So since then, you know, we, um, we've done a few commercial projects and some residential and the journey goes on. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Good to hear. And look, it's exciting, right? Um, as soon as you move that and do that transition from, you know, a nine to five to running your own business, yes, you are on steroids on pretty much every day. Um, but that, you know, that day doesn't stop, that day doesn't end, but the rewards do not stop as well, right? And so the idea is to how to use that cash flow that you're making it out in the business and how to divert that into making much more passive investments or passive income, right? So We'll definitely have a show of its own where we would unpack a lot of this about problems that the business owners have and how do people do that transition from doing a nine to five to a business. And uh, yeah. Absolutely. And I think part of the um, discussion, um, I wanted to bring up a few questions and pick your brain a few things. And one of the things I wanted to um, discuss that, you know, what, what is a serviceability trap? And, and I think I am in that situation right now as we speak that I have hit that threshold where the banks are kind of telling me, uh, normal credit card, you know, we've, we've given you enough money and this is the end of it. So I guess um, I'm, I'm very interested to understand w w what is this all about. So if you can just shed some light and um, share some uh, knowledge. Yeah, definitely. And look, serviceability trap is basically when the bank says a big, big fat no to you. So when you are asking the bank to borrow more money to continue your property journey. And so majority of the times when this happens is, you know, when you're buying your last home or you're going for that one last uh, investment property and, you know, you will not be able to get the desired outcome in relation to the borrowing capacity that you're looking for, the purchase price that you're looking for. Now, of course, I, I say this time and time again, property is the game of cash flows. It's not so much about cash. And so that is where the frustration comes in for a lot of buyers like you and I. You know, we've been in the same boat majority of the times, right, where you have shit loads of equities sitting in your property portfolio, but you go to the bank and the bank says, nah, we're not going to give you any more money. And be like, well, I'm sitting on a million dollars here, bro. You know, why are you not giving me more money, right? Yes. Uh, but it's all about the problem with the cash flow. It's not so much the cash. And so it's always usually when, you know, people have acquired like two properties, mom and dad investors we're talking about, right? You know, they would have acquired two properties and they go for the third one. And naturally, you know, bang, you know, that door shuts down and the bank so it says, you know, piss yeah. off, you know, yeah. <laughs> basically. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yes. And um, yeah. So, so I guess, you know, and that's exactly where I am. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and to add and take this further, right, I always say this, that as an investor, you're allowed to make two mistakes. Okay. You would walk guilty free. Uh, make two mistakes and no harm would be done to you, right? But let me ask you, why only two mistakes? Why not six or seven? So could you could you um, divulge on that a little bit more? Yes, yeah, sure. And look, it's it's a, it's a rhetoric question. And so if you take a step back and think about an average income earner in Australia, you know they would be sitting somewhere around eighty to ninety thousand dollars. You know, family yeah. income of roughly about one forty five to one fifty, right? So you take six times of DTI, which is the debt to income ratio, they can usually borrow about a million dollars, which is enough for them to get two loans, um, but it's not enough to get them three loans, right? And so let me 
share a story here. I met a client once. They were on a combined income of $250,000. So decent income, right? But they had only two properties. And so typical mistake, you know, they started off, you know, with their first property at $1.5 million, bought a nice, beautiful home, <laughs> big backyard. Yes. Like it, uh, they had their swimming pool at the back. And so, you know, they went all in, right? And uh, naturally, you know, they bought two more properties. All of them are in Melbourne. Melbourne is crap. Melbourne, the rents are really, really cheap. I shouldn't say Melbourne is crap, but from an investment perspective also, when you start with Melbourne, of course, you don't get the rental yields, right? You get shitloads of growth, but you don't get the yields. Yeah. And so from their perspective, their serviceability was completely blocked, even at $250,000. And so when I met them, I was like, well, this is investor 101 mistake, right? This is a typical mistake that every investor would make. And so the third time they go to the bank, the, the bank is like, well, you've done enough as to what you want to do. And so I say two mistakes is because those two properties, if you don't make those right decisions, that's it for you, right? That's it. You're done. You know, you can't do much. And so the question is now completely different as to how do you sell them? How do you remediate them? How do you come out of these properties? So I guess at this point, um, I guess, you know, these people are seasoned professionals in terms of in their own domain, you know, they could be an accountant, they could be an IT professionals. And so I guess they're smart people, but why do, why do these people uh, or, you know, early investors, you know, why do they fall in this trap? Yeah. And hundred percent, you know, all of these, like the client that I was talking about, super smart, right? I mean, he runs um, a project division in, in, in a big multinational IT company. So super smart people. But naturally, when you think about some of these investors, they have this fake sense of economic created around you. You know, they listen to various different property profits, property gurus, property coaches, you name it, and it's out there. So if you think about some of these things, the media's job is really to entertain. It's not to educate. And so if you are wanting to get an education from them, you would hear about, oh, you can buy 10 properties in 10 years, or you can be financially independent in three to five years. What they don't realize is that the income is finite. And sooner or later, the bank would turn them around and say, look, you know, that's the door. See you later. And so what they tend to do is they don't have a strategy in place. They work their ass off, you know, in, in trying to building their portfolio. But naturally what happens is they because they're not strategic about buying these properties, they go for non-investment grade properties or out of the two or three properties that they would acquire. You know, one may hit the mark and two may not hit the mark. They, they would buy properties which are super negative cash flow. And so when the banks are assessing them at higher rates, you know, banks are looking at it in a much more worst case scenario from a cash flow perspective. So the investors fall into this trap because of the reactive nature of their thinking. It's not proactive nature of their thinking. You know, every time they are at their back foot thinking about this, they would always fall into this trap. And look, I mean, we are prone to, you know, a lot of these things too. You know, if, if I take myself back, you know, 2015, 2016, I was super stuck. You know, I had four properties and I couldn't move anything. And so I was like, what do I do? How do I go about navigating around some of these things to unlock myself? And I guess that that's exactly, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself there. But most the question I pose to you is if, if, if it's such a massive problem and it's a real problem and, and a lot of people, including myself, can relate to that. So why are people as unaware of this? And if this is such a re real big thing, you know, wh wh why people are just not talking about it? Yeah. And so I don't think that it's, it's that people are unaware. I think people are definitely aware. They just put a blind eye to it. And so they only realize this when they are going to the bank and asking that question. And yes. so even worse, I, met, I meet people who have already heard a big fat no from the bank. And so they are now looking for the solutions like you, for example, right? Yes. And so they've been in an accident and what they are basically doing is they're looking for an insurance company to provide an insurance cover now, right? Yeah. Basically, that's the scenario that you're in, right? Yes. And so the event has already happened. So why would you think that the insurance company would give you an insurance now? Or, or can I say this? You know, they yeah. can see the storm coming yeah. towards them um, and they can see their house, you know, about to be run down or burned down or finished off by this storm. And so they're running towards people saying, hey, how can I protect my house? Well, there's no, there's no protection. You protect yeah. yourself now. There's no protection for the house anymore. 
And so, you know, they would meet a priest and, you know, the priest would be like, close your eyes and pray to God. <laughs> and the God would protect your house. And yeah, 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 fingers crossed, man. I mean, it would work, right? You know, but yeah. ultimately, you know, you would meet a magician who would get them to wear some glasses where it would say that there is no storm there. And yeah. probably that magician would charge them $7,000 to make them feel happy, right? Well, in inflation, you know, everything's gone up. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and so it's important that you are in control and you are aware about some of these things. And so the important question here is not so much about why people are unaware. I think the important question is, why do people end up being into these positions, right? Exactly. And then that's my question. You know, can, can we talk about it? So why do they end up in this position? Yeah, and it's it's all about asking the right questions and asking asking the right and and getting the right answers, right? So I would probably split them into five or six parts. And if you if you think about this, you know, you go to your broker, you talk to your broker every day. Yeah, as as a smart investor, as a serial seasonal investor, people would usually be talking to their broker at least once every three months. So every time you you talk to your broker, naturally, what you need to do is you need to understand what the strategy is, understand each and every property that you're going to acquire. How is that going to change your property portfolio? How is that going to change your strategy in the future? Hell, you know, you should, you need to sit with the broker and understand the whole strategy in place. You know, there are softwares, there are places where you can create a mortgage strategy and put it in place. You know, we do that for our clients. You know, we would basically set up the whole strategy in, in setting stone. We call it, you know, a property strategy in blueprint. And basically, that's what you need to do. You need to have a strategy in place to basically go and implement it so that you know how each and every property is going to impact your decision making. Okay. Number two, of course, having a very, very good team behind you is very important, especially as a business owner. The broker is one side of the equation, but you need the accountant on your side. You need the strategies of the buyers agents on one side. And so if they are all working in different directions, of course, you know, you wouldn't be able to achieve what you want to achieve. Number three, um, and we have talked about this, you know, having a, a proactive strategy in place is very, very important. It's about how do you transition yourself from being a first time investor to an experienced investor to a high net worth investor? Or how do you transition from being a mediocre investor to a high net worth investor? Okay. And you hear people saying, be water, flow freely, you know, in these circumstances, you are you can't be a water because you can end up being in gutter as people are navigating you through some of these things, right? <laughs> I say be a road, you know, and know where your destination is and create that road basically, right? Rather than just talking about being the water. Um, two more things, understanding the trust and the structures around this and how do you go about navigating through some of those things. And, you know, trust is a very, very important vehicle in helping you build a sustainable property portfolio. It can travel into generational wealth. And the last but not the least, it's about lenders itself. You know, people are stuck with major banks. You know, they only know Westpac and NAB and they own so they only know Westpac and NAB and Commonwealth Bank and Bank West, probably, right? And ANZ. Um, they don't know the mid-tiers, they don't know the third tiers, right? And people think that, oh, just because they're mid-tiers or third tiers. They are just poor banks, so they are quite. They have high interest rates, for example. And, and again, most just to add there, like I think I am guilty of that. You know, last twenty years I have been borrowing money from financial institutions, and I have been revolving around these big fours, and nothing else kind of you know has has jumped out. Um, and I haven't really explored. And I think those four banks have just kind of put in this false sense of security, and then. You know, um, we, we have not been looking. So I guess this is something after discussion with you some days ago, I, um, I, I, I need to explore those uh, mid-tier lenders as well. 100%. And look, I think it's important to unpack a bit about the lending and the lenders, right? So what naturally people do is they go to a big four bank, you know, to get their first loan and they get their second loan. So what you're doing is you're giving good business up front to them. So of course, when you're going to go to the mid-tier bank, they're going to charge you higher interest rate because you're bringing much more riskier business to them. So if you start your journey at the mid-tier and the third tier, of course, if you're giving them good business, they'll love you, right? They'll give you the same rates. You know, the problem is they want to keep their principal place and the nicer place and the place with a lot of equity and growth with big banks. Yes. And all these shitty investments, the side investments that the side hustles that people are doing, they want to go to the shitty, shitty banks. Or I shouldn't say shitty banks, but mid-tier banks or second-tier banks, right? 
So and uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess most um, you know we we talked at length these some of these problems and you know we there's two guys talking and I guess um, you know if 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 you were a female or I was a female then the conversation would have been very different than you know it, you know if you were just a female and I'm a male I would just I need to just hear the problem and not give any solutions and that's how it goes but since we're two guys I'm, I'm going to get direct to the point so I say hey that's a problem give me a solution so I really want to hear what the solution is so. Yeah, tell me, hundred percent. And look, I mean, I'm not going to pretend here. I'm the smart one in in this room, right? I think you know. Uh, I always say this that you know you need to be in the rooms where you are not the smartest one. And if you are in a room where you are the smartest one, you're definitely hanging out in the wrong crowd. Anything that we are sharing here today um, is either experience or luck. Okay, and there's no there's no shame in admitting that. Okay, you've made the mistakes and you're successful because you have learn from your mistakes and realize how to go about, you know, overcoming some of these problems, right? And this, the second important thing is hindsight. Hindsight is a beautiful thing. You know, the, the quicker you realize what you did right in the past and what you did wrong, it would basically help you bounce back quickly. So um, it's, it's all about exploring your true potential. And so the more mistakes you make, the more successful you become. And if you haven't really explored any mistakes in your life, I truly believe that you can never be, you can never truly explore your potential if you haven't really made any mistakes. So l- let me share my story as to, you know, what are the real solutions of some of these problems and what did I do? So, of course, you know, if I go back 2013, 2012, you know, I was in a property grabbing journey too, like any other person. And so, you know, you acquire one property, you acquire two property, you acquire a third property, and you hear a big fat no from the bank. And of course, you know, the interest rate was a lot worse during that time versus yeah. where it is right now. Yes, people are complaining right now that, oh, it's sitting at five, five and a half percent. But, you know, hey, you know, it was starting off at like eight percent at that time, right? Yeah. And so it was it was the same feeling, you know, you're doing three jobs, you're sacrificing your work-life balance or it's all work, no life, basically. And you're reasonably wealthy or relatively wealthy on paper. But what's the point of having a decent valuation where you are thinking about, oh, fuck, I can't even have a cup of coffee, right? Or you're going out with friends and you're pretending that you're not hungry, right? So (laughs) We've all been there, Moss. (laughs) Yes. And so, you know, and people naturally think, what the hell is wrong with this guy? You know, this guy talks about having like four properties, but, you know, we are here out having fun. He's not spending any money. What's wrong? And... It's, it's a typical feeling of being stuck, right? And what did I do? Like, this was no means by a calculated move in any way, shape, or form, okay? I acquired a property. That property, by luck, was a development property. By luck. 100%. I have no shame in admitting that at that time, that it was a development property. I didn't know about it. Um, I found out through a friend uh, who is the development director right now in our company. And so he said to me, hey, Moss, you know, through a networking event, do you realize that you can save the, this house at the front and build, you know, two units at the back, or you could build four units here? And I was like, well, tell me more. And basically that was, that was the first property that I acquired, which had multiple exit strategies. So it was a typical, what we call it as a splitter block, or people call it as a battle X block. And the magic happened basically that, I had a lot of money that I can ac- that I cannot access, but I could access a little bit of equity. And that was enough for me to basically run a development approval on that property. And so I went with the easiest route possible. I subdivided the front, renovated a bit, subdivided the front, sold the front, built two townhouses at the back, created an exit strategy for myself, made shit loads of money for that first development, um, and realized that, well, if you can replicate this strategy, this would be the perfect strategy in breaking the ice, in breaking the serviceability trap. More importantly is this, right? And so naturally people think about this as to, okay, so you subdivided the front. How did you build the back? You didn't have money, right? Where did the money come from? And so this is where the interesting bits happen. So let's talk numbers, right? I acquired the property for about $700,000, roughly. Okay, and I'm going to give you round numbers. So I acquired the property at about $700,000. I subdivided it. I sold the front. At still about six hundred thousand dollars, five eighty five, six hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so I I had the property at the back, including stamps, at about hundred one fifty, somewhere around there. Okay, so th- there was a land where I could put two townhouses, um, and that land had costed me about hundred fifty thousand dollars. Let's round it up to two hundred, right? Let's round it up. Okay, 
And so I got a builder and I asked the builder, I'm building these two houses here. Can you tell me roughly what about going is going to cost? And he indicated 550 to 600 is what's going to cost. So all up about $800,000, okay? I got the, to the bank. I said to the bank, I have this land. I have $150,000 loan on this land now. I want to build two townhouses. Can you give me some money? And so the bank does what the bank does. They did their calculation. And they said, holy shit, this guy sells this and makes 1.4 million, right? And so us giving him 800,000 or 500,000 or 600,000 is not a bad risk, right? You know, he's going to pay us back. There's shit loads of equity there. And so the conversation changes every time you go into these construction finance loans. It's not so much about, hey, can you borrow this because of your cash flow? The conversation is, can you make money out of this? And can you provide a cleaner exit from a bank's perspective? And so they did. They gave me the money. I built the houses. I sold one. I sold two, got my money back and went again. And that was a perfect strategy. So, Moss, let me, let me get this right. So, parking a development potential property in your portfolio helps you unlock your serviceability and helps you continue your journey. Is that the only way to unlock the serviceability? No, no, of course not. Look, of course, development parking or using developments as is a key step to unlocking your serviceability. And you have to do that earlier in the journey, especially when you're building your portfolio. Okay, where people go really wrong is that they try to find a development potential property when it's their last property that they, acquire, they can acquire from the bank, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're stuck. You know, you can only spend $300,000. And so, you know, uh, you know how many clients come to me and say to me, hey, I have borrowing capacity of 300. I have a cash of about 150. Find me a development property for 450. <laughs> it's like... I'm not a magician. I'm not. You know, I, ca I can't do magic, right? And so you need to be strategic about it. You know, if you're going to buy these properties, you have to buy them strategically in your property portfolio in such a way that, you know, they are probably your second or your third acquisition, not your last acquisition where, you know, you are struggling for cash. It's very important, okay? Now, what other ways can you unlock your serviceability, okay? So, uh, ensure that you're creating a sustainable property portfolio around that development property is very important. So if you are making a development property acquisition, which is acquisition number two or acquisition number three, and mind you, like, you know, we've done these acquisitions in Adelaide, in Queensland, in Perth, you know, they are sitting at decent yields. You know, some of these come in at five and a half, six percent yield as well. So don't think that, oh, just because it's a development property with big land, you can't get a higher yield on this, right? And so naturally people think, oh, you can't get a higher yield on some of these properties. Wrong, you can. The, the second most important thing is that when you're building some of these, uh, when, you, when you're thinking about you know, how to unlock your serviceability, uh, there are also things like uh, using your own property, whatever properties that you have and converting them. Converting them in such a way that you can, one, either create better cash flow out of it, okay, or two, manufacture equity out of it. So it doesn't always have to be a full-scale development property where you can do something at the back or subdivide and, you know, and build side by side, for example, right? It could as simple as be, you know, it's a three-bedroom, one-bathroom, and you're converting into a four-bedroom, two-bathroom. It's a perfect, you know, exit strategy for yourself, okay? Or, you know, what we're doing a lot in Perth right now, and even in Adelaide, where you know, you buy four by two and so four bedroom, two bathroom, and you are basically splitting the house in such a way that, you know, you are having one single studio or self-contained studio, and then you have a three bedroom, one bathroom, you're renting them out separately. And so from all of a sudden, your rent goes from, or yield goes from say 5% straight away to 8% or 9%. Very, very strong. Okay. So you can use those strategies as well to push more cash flow into your property portfolio and get better landing from the bank. Now, last but not the least, okay? And so uh, we've talked about the trusts and, you know, trusts play a very, very important part in unlocking your serviceability. And if you're not sure, speak to your accountant, speak to your broker, speak to a property strategist. They should be able to guide you. Of course, we should not constitute this current uh, podcast as a financial advice anyway, but trust is a very powerful vehicle to unlock your, uh, your serviceabilities as well or protect your serviceabilities in the first place. But last but not the least, it's a, it's a direction that you have taken, Moby, right? It's these transitions from PAYG to business owners, right? Business owners have 
infinite amount of debt available to them. And I'm very, very carefully choosing my words, right? The reason I'm saying infinite because you can create an infinite amount of cash flow depending on what your business is and can get as much income or debt as possible um, on the side. And so it's, it's a constant struggle of, okay, how much cash flow do you want to create in your business and how much debt do you want to raise against it to basically invest into properties? I always counsel people, have an active ABN, have an active, do a side hustle on the side, create some business income on the side. That would drive you home for the, that would definitely drive you home. So I guess, um, you know, these words of wisdom has um, really resonated with me and, um, and, and the, a, a lot of people, I can, I can, I can count on my, you know, there's so many people I know would be in exactly the same spot and the, the kind of value um, we've gotten out of this, um, this chat discussion platform is absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, I, I, I really wanted to thank you for letting me be part of this journey. And we would love to um, continue and learn a bit more from you, um, from all your development experience. Yeah, hundred percent. It was lovely to have you on the show today, Moby. And uh, we would definitely have more fun uh, and more fun topics in the future. Absolutely. Thank you to the listeners as well. Perfect. Well, thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you guys. This is Moss checking out. Be safe. Be kind. Stay safe. Keep smiling. This is Investor Partner Group. Peace out. Adios. <laughs>